I'm going to read you a couple of statements, and I want you to tell me how well each one describes you through a show of fingers. A show of fingers? Yes, a show of fingers. Uh, if it doesn't describe you at all, um, hold up one finger. If it fits you to a T, hold up five. Somewhere in between, two, three, or four. Got it? All right, let's try. I often have tender, concerned feelings for people less fortunate than me. How well does that describe you? All right. Let's try again. I try to look at everyone's side of a disagreement before I make a decision. How about that one? Wow, impressive. Uh, the more you agree with statements like these, the more you experience empathy, a simple word for a complex idea. Think back to the last time that a friend of yours was upset. Maybe you caught his emotion and became upset too. But maybe you also tried to piece together what it is he felt and why. Empathy comprises both of these abilities, to share and also to understand what other people are going through. The empathy in this room, very high, maybe not surprisingly, uh, and people's collective empathy is like the human equivalent of a natural resource. It's a precious one. Empathic people benefit in all sorts of ways. They are happier and attract friends more easily than their less empathic peers. They excel at work, especially if their work involves people, like sales or management. Empathy's benefits ripple outward, too. Patients of empathic doctors report less depression. Employees of empathic managers are less stressed. And empathic people's romantic partners are more satisfied in their relationships. Um, but the news is not all good. For one, our collective empathy is eroding over time. Take the questions like the one I just asked you. People have been answering questions like these for decades, allowing psychologists to map our collective empathy over time. Here's the average empathy score in 1979, and here it is 30 years later. In that time, empathy had decreased so much that the average person was less empathic than three quarters of people 30 years before. And even people who try to be generally empathic can find it difficult in some circumstances. Think back to a conflict that you had with someone in the last month, or week, or day. Many of you told me just now that you're extremely empathic, but in that moment, did you do everything you could to listen, understand, and connect? Oftentimes, when our ideas or values or feelings clash, empathy becomes too hard, and we abandon it altogether. Right now, politics is America's empathic black hole. We've retreated into ideological silos, uh, tuning out people who we disagree with, or even worse, savoring their pain. This is a fractured time. Compassion feels endangered. Being a psychologist studying empathy today is a little bit like being a climatologist studying the polar ice caps. We discover the value of something just as it disappears all around us. Does it have to be this way? That depends on how you think empathy works. For centuries, philosophers and scientists have told us it's a trait inherited through our genes, hardwired into our brain, something that you either have or don't have. I call this the Roddenberry hypothesis because Gene Roddenberry enshrined it into the characters of the greatest television show of all time, <laughs> Star Trek The Next Generation. No, that is not up for debate. Thank you. I'm glad to have so many fellow Trekkies here. Um, on one side, we have the USS Enterprise's ship's counselor, Deanna Troy, known throughout the galaxy for her empathy. She catches other people's feelings and can read their mind. On the other side, we have the android Data, who doesn't feel emotions himself and can't tell what other people are feeling either. According to conventional wisdom, each of us has a level of empathy somewhere between these two. And like our adult height, we're stuck there for life. So that means if empathy is too hard for you, there's nothing you can do to overcome your limits. And if our collective empathy is dwindling, we can't do anything about that either. This is all pretty fatalistic. Um, thankfully, it's also wrong. <laughs> I want to tell you about a new view of empathy um, that, for me, is actually not new at all. In fact, it defined much of my childhood. In 1972, Washington State University offered scholarships to students from the world's poorest nations. My mom got the one from Peru, and my dad the one from Pakistan. They traveled from Lima and Lahore, each city bigger than New York, to the sleepy town of Pullman, where they fell in love looking very 70s in the process, I might say. <laughs> <laughs> the 
For them, though, it was not meant to be. Uh, the biggest thing that my parents had in common was their foreignness to the U.S. And as they grew more comfortable in their new home, they grew less comfortable with each other. They realized that their personalities were as far apart as their hometowns. They began divorcing when I was six, but didn't finish until I was 10. For years, I was shuttled back and forth between their houses, but I might as well have been zipping between distant worlds. My mom is quintessentially Peruvian, full of warmth and nerves. She values family above all else. My dad prizes intellect and ambition. Where he came from, the student who scored highest on an exam would end up in college, and the student who scored second highest would end up on the streets. I'm an only child, and I was the only bridge between their worlds. When I was with my mom, I had to learn the rules that governed her heart and mind and make them true for myself. But when I reached the, my dad, those rules didn't apply anymore, and I had to recalibrate to his very different reality. This was hard emotional labor for a six-year-old, uh, and sometimes it felt like I'd give up and I'd have to choose between my mom or my dad. But I knew that for the sake of all of us, I had to keep trying. And eventually, it got easier. I learned to tune myself to their different emotional frequencies, and that allowed me to maintain a strong bond with each of them, even as their connection to each other disintegrated. Empathy saved me, but not because it came easily. My parents' divorce was like an empathy gym for me, forcing me to work at care and understanding. And that experience of stretching myself and the benefits that it caused is part of why I study what I do in the first place. Over the years, I found lots of evidence that contradicts standard wisdom but jives with my own experience. It turns out that empathy isn't really that much of a trait at all. It's more like a skill. We're not stuck at one level of empathy throughout our lives. Certain experiences, like a hateful political climate, can atrophy it. Others, like having to manage two very different parents, can grow it. And we can grow our empathy on purpose through practice. You make choices about whether to practice empathy or not all the time. Will you cross the street to avoid a homeless person or pay attention to their pain? Will you dismiss someone who disagrees with you or try to figure out why they feel the way they do? When we practice engaging over and over again, we build an empathy that is deeper, broader, and more muscular. There's all sorts of examples of this, but I'll just give you two. The first pertains to the question that I get asked most of all, which is, are women more empathic than men? <laughs> it certainly seems that way sometimes. Maybe we have stories. And there are cases where women outperform men, for instance, in tests where they're supposed to guess what other people feel. If empathy is a trait, then men just might be all thumbs when it comes to emotion. We might be forever stuck in a Venus-Mars problem. But if empathy is a skill, then maybe these differences are circumstantial. Two psychologists put this to the test in a classic study. They first found, as others had, that women outperformed men on an emotion understanding task. But then they told both men and women, guess what, we'll pay you for being accurate about what other people feel. <laughs> You might guess what's coming next, uh, but this completely eliminated the gender gap in empathy. <laughs> so it turns out we're not totally hopeless. <laughs> If we have reason to practice empathy, we do, and we get better in the process. <laughs> I think we can all practice empathy. Ironically, though, simply believing that it's a trait can get in our way. Decades of evidence demonstrate that when people think they can't change something about themselves, like how smart or open-minded they are, they shy away from challenges. When they think they can grow, they open up instead. Recently, my colleagues and I tested whether this was true of empathy as well. We had people read articles suggesting either that empathy was a trait, um, which is pretty stable over time, or that it was a skill which is changeable and can be developed. Then we ran them through an empathy obstacle course full of situations that make caring tough. Over and over, we found that when people believed that empathy was a skill, they worked harder at it. They spent more time listening to the struggles of someone of a different race. They spent more energy trying to understand the perspective of political outsiders. When we empowered them, they stretched their empathy past its typical boundaries. As a kid, 
I was lucky to have an empathy gym. Now my lab provides that opportunity for other people. We've worked with hundreds of college freshmen and thousands of middle schoolers throughout the Bay Area. We instill in these students the idea that empathy is a skill and encourage them to practice it even when it feels hard. Because we believe that over time, empathic practice turns into empathic habits and eventually empathic people. We're not the only ones in the empathy building business, and I want to tell you about some people who inspire me. Sue Rar heads police training for the state of Washington, and she's brought empathy front and center. Cadets in her program, like this one, go through mock crime scenes and practice diffusing tense situations by slowing down, asking questions, and paying attention to what other people feel. Since Rar took over, Officers' use of force has declined all over Washington, especially towards people with mental illness. In a dark moment for American policing, she's cast a light. <laughs> Life After Hate was founded by Angela King, Tony McAleer, and their colleagues, all of whom were once white supremacists but now have reformed and worked to extract other people from the dark place they once inhabited. Hundreds of hate group members contact Life After Hate each year. Tony, Angela, and their colleagues teach them that although hatred buries empathy, it doesn't kill it, and that even people who have lost their way can get it back. Tony and Angela embody this in their own stories. They call themselves formers to acknowledge their past but also to acknowledge the idea that we're all still forming, able to choose new paths and forge new connections. <laughs> Tony, Angela, and Sue tackle some of the hardest issues of our time, and they teach us that empathy can bloom even in barren soil. We should all take a page from their book. Earlier I told you that when people know empathy is a skill, they work harder at it. Hopefully by now you know empathy is under your control. I challenge all of us to empathize with purpose, especially when it's hard. Let's point our care at the voiceless, the homeless individual or refugee who we might otherwise ignore. Let's point our curiosity at people who anger us, even when ignoring them feels easier. If more of us can make choices like this, we can begin to regrow our collective empathy and mend the tears in our social fabric. And that's the good news here. Empathy is not just a precious resource, it's also a renewable one. Thank you. <laughs>